Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And welcome to the Humanities Festival and to this talk with our guest today, Martin Gulias from Hungary, from Budapest. This year we are celebrating 30 years of the fall of the uh, Iron Curtain, 30 years of transformation in Central and Eastern Europe, and we are devoting a part of the Humanities Festival program um, to talks in which we rethink what happened to this region, what happened to Central and Eastern Europe in the last 30 years. Usually when we try to reflect on that, we invite people who play the role in the change, in this 30 years of change, either before it or during the transition. But this time, we decided to invite someone who is almost as old as the transition itself. He's just three years old, if I'm not three years older, <laughs> just 33. So uh, he doesn't have um, a memory from the communist Hungary. He only remembers the democratic or aiming to democratize or sliding out of democracy <laughs> Hungary. Uh, so, uh, Martin Gulas was born in 86. Um, he started, um, the way I know him is as a theater maker first and as a manager of one very important Hungarian theater company, Kretekör. Um, later on, uh, slowly he started, probably through uh, the artistic work itself, but this will be one of my later questions, to engage more and more in civic action. So later on, he co-founded leftist political activist group uh, Human Platform. He started the biggest political YouTube channel, which is vastly popular in Hungary and um, in an era where the traditional media is more and more under suffering censorship. Uh, is the platform where independent voices find a uh, way to be heard. Uh, the platform is Slame, called. Of his founder and activist of the Country for All movement, um, and uh, something quite peculiar, he was recently declared by the Orban government a national security risk. <laughs> Um, he's known for his political activism also recently in relation to the threat uh, to the Central European University, which Orban wanted to uh, push out of the country. So we have And he today, achieved it actually. <laughs> yes, uh, we have one of the more um, active, the most active young resistance voices to the Orban regime here as guest uh, tonight. Uh, to, to, not tonight, today, <laughs> this afternoon. Um, so I want to start, um, so to say, chronologically. What was the Hungary you, you grew up uh, in? How do you remember the Hungary of your childhood or the, the period when you, um, let's say, became 18 years old and uh, already had the right to vote? What is the Hungary you remember? You don't remember the communist Hungary. But in terms of um, liberty, democracy, what was your experience then? This was the time when you started working in theater as well and engaged with Kretekör. Tell us about this period, which is, I think, prior to your civic and political engagement. Okay, thank you very much for this warm uh, introduction and hello to everyone. Um, I want to make just a small correction, not because I would like to correct you, but because I guess it's an important issue if we, talk, if we are talking about what went wrong with Hungary, that we didn't have communism at all. We had a state-run capitalism before the transition, and that's very important. Um, and I guess uh, what went wrong with Hungary, it's very much related to the previous state of the Hungarian state. Um, and I have some memories back at that time. So I remember those marches around 98 uh, when, the, for example, there was this huge demonstration on the so-called Hero Square uh, where the Hungarians were demonstrating against the demolishing of the Hungarian villages and other villages in Romania uh, orchestrated by Ceausescu. And that was a very huge demonstration and we were there and I have some tiny memories or even I just have, you know, I just watched too many uh, footages about that time, but I have this memory inside me that yes, we were there. Um, and after the transition, I remember, my father was a document and still a documentary maker, and my mother was a teacher. 
And I remember that my father was employed by the Hungarian um, film factory. And all the directors, uh, DOPs, and other filmmakers were employed. So they were state employed uh, persons. And that was very important because then, back at that time, they didn't have to, you know, uh, deal with the issue that half can we pay our rents, half can we, you know, put food on the table. Of course, they were not overpaid. So it was a, but it was a decent salary, let's say that. And my father uh, got unemployed after the transition and he got depressed and his mental and health status decreased uh, unbelievably. So I, I remember my childhood memory of the transition is that my father is laying in his bed constantly and not even capable of moving. And my mother was the one who, you know, hold the family together. And he was a teacher back at that time. He, well, she was a teacher, sorry, back at that time. And we, so I have two, I have a brother and a sister, so we were three. And so she, she's a very brave and a very tough woman. And, but, but, you know, it's very important that back at that time, this um, role of maternity was not acknowledged by the society. So this was a norm. But, you know, from 2019, uh, I recognized that my mother was such a brave and such a, you know, strong person who, during that economic crisis, during that political turmoil, was capable of doing uh, what she had to do to keep this family together. So I really, really appreciate her efforts. But, and it, 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 it had a political impact on my awareness and about my, uh, you know, observation of our society. Because on one hand, you know, MTV came in with the commercials, with the video clips, McDonald's came in, and everybody was crazy about this, you know, Western stuff. New movies came in, new uh, shopping malls opened. So the first five years after the transition was this craziness among this uh, middle class or upper middle class or, 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 or urban people when we were just, you know, um, observing that, yes, more and more services are uh, available and we can buy hot dogs and we can buy new clothes and we can buy stuff. So this was this consummation period when everybody who had, uh, you know, necessary funds were really, 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 you know, um, how can I say, full with these options and, 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 and everybody was just about, yes, we are part of the Western society, uh, finally. Uh, but after 95, slowly, the realization of the devastating effects of the transition came into, not the mainstream, because it came into the mainstream just after the 2008 uh, crisis, but some you know, circles of the society started to realize that no, transition was not about, you know, becoming part of the Western society. It was a history of one million people losing its job immediately. Who and where, no one knows, because no documentaries were made about it. Some documentaries were made about it, and some um, um, sociologists made some research on the field during it back, back at that time. But, but you know, it was not, you know, a, core agenda, a main agenda of the TV, of the, I don't know, academic sphere and stuff like that. So the Hungarian society completely lost the, 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 the history of the transition of those people who were affected the most. And when I'm talking about one million people, it means that every family in the Hungarian society was affected in some way. But it's, and it's a devastating effect. It's not about, you know, just, okay, I lost my job, but I will go to the, I don't know, the, the job market, and I will apply and write a CV, and then something will happen. No, because these were factory workers, uh, people who are undereducated, or were educated to a completely different system, and were used to completely different types of jobs. So they were not, you know, marketable enough to, you know, uh, get a job in a market society. And that was the problem that no one dealt with the problem that, okay, uh, we said that right now we are a liberal capitalist society, but who owns the capital? And the capital was owned by a tiny fragment of the elite who, you know, were 
part of the elite before the transition already. And they were in the position to both factories, lands, houses, and so on, and so on, and so on. So in the first five years of the, after the transition, a dramatic change happened. No one realized because we were absolutely, I'm not just talking about myself, but I'm talking about the generation which was in their 20s or in their 30s. I'm talking about my brother's generation. So they had this kind of uh, feeling that, yes, right now we can go to, I don't know, Paris, we can go to Vienna, uh, we can buy things, and we can have, you know, access to different TV channels, and Michael Jackson is singing, and, you know, we can go not just to the Platinum Sea, but we can go to the ocean and to the sea. So these kind of uh, opportunities gave the society or the tiny fraction of a society the illusion of freedom, uh, the spectacle of freedom. And it was very important that when we realized, or where, when this tiny fraction started to realize that this kind of a freedom is very, very limited to a very tiny fraction of the society. And it was already late, because back at that time, those people who were betrayed by the financial and the political elite, they are already um, was infused or was somehow, you know, uh, got used to the uh, anti-Semitic and extreme right populist agenda. So there was a figure called uh, Churka István. He was a very well-known uh, playwright in Hungary. Uh, he was a good playwright, actually, so he had, he had some great dramas. And he started his political, political career around the transition. And after the transition, he was member of the first government, uh, the party which formed the government. Uh, but after a couple of years, because of tensions within the party, he left the party and created uh, the first openly anti-Semitic and openly uh, extreme right political party in the country. And he was very popular because he was not just talking about the, the, gypsy uh, the Jewish uh, conspiration, but he was talking about real issues, but attached the real problems, the real economic problems with these conspiracy theories about international, you know, ruling of the Jewish people and so on and so on and so on, Israel. And because there was no other language, no other narrative for the daily experience of those people who lost their jobs and lost everything which their parents had before, that's why anti-Semitism and that's why extreme right rhetoric and language was the only only language available to express their crisis. I'm talking about the people. And it's very important because back at that time it was just, um, so everybody thought in the liberal side, in the so-called leftist side that, okay, it's, it's, just a, it's just an extremity. We don't have to deal with that. We just have to say that this is not uh, acceptable. Of course it's not acceptable. But when you refuse to talk about the issues, when you, no, no, when you refuse to talk then you refuse this kind of a talk, then you refused also the issues. No one dealt about uh, job losses, closed factories, collapse markets from the liberal side, from the leftist side, because they said that this is the way we have to go through to create a liberal and capitalist society, which is the ultimate reason why we made the transition. And of course, in the 50, in, or around 95, it seemed that really, yes, really, it's, um, it's really just a tiny fraction of the society. But it was not. Just didn't have the uh, representation. They didn't have, you know, newspapers, TV, and so on. So because they didn't have the representation, it, seems that they, it seemed that they were just a tiny fraction. But no, actually, this agenda, this narrative about what went wrong with Hungary during the transition, became a kind of a semi-mainstream among the people. And I'm making it shorter. In 2010, that was the main reason why an openly right-wing government was able to get the constitutional majority in the parliament. But we will talk about it later. But sorry. But elaborate a little bit more <clears throat> on that, because isn't it more natural that a leftist agenda would be the response to this process that you described of people losing their um, bread, uh, losing jobs, uh, suffering the transition, 
Um, the left-wing response would have been the more appropriate one, it seems. So could you elaborate why do you see Orban, his government, and his political agenda as the answer to this process that you just described? Um, Is it about pride and not about really well-being of people? Is it more about their pride of being Hungarians? Uh, is this pride a compensation of something else? Look, if you are poor and if you realize that uh, you have absolutely zero chance to go you know, forward and you see that your kids will get less than you got and you got already very much less than your grandparents got, uh, when you see that, yes, um, the land and all the major parts of the Hungarian economy was, on one hand, you know, um, 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 bought by, bought, uh, by uh, the Hungarian you know, elite uh, the, from the so-called socialism, or on the other hand, bought by multinational companies and foreign investors. So if you see that, yes, this country is completely, and sorry for my expression, but fucked up, uh, then the only thing which you can rely on is pride. So that's very, it's, 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 it's one of the simplest, you know, uh, phenomenon. So um, we have a dysfunctional healthcare system, we have a dysfunctional schooling system, we have a, we have a dysfunctional uh, society in general, and I'm not talking about the current uh, nature of the society. I'm talking about what we had before 2010 already. So the, the, the state media, the public media was biased, of course, hugely biased. Uh, of course, corruption was on an extremely high level. Uh, you cannot name a single politician from the governmental party which you can look it up and say, okay, he or she is a good guy and she or he is working for the people. So the problem was that the entire elite seemed extremely, you know, corrupted and not, you know, uh, trustworthy enough. So if you are in that situation in 2010, that's a very understandable and very reasonable decision that, okay, everybody is corrupt and nobody is, you know, capable of delivering a decent change. But this guy, I'm talking about Orban, says, okay, nothing will happen, nothing will be better, but we will be proud Hungarians. I can only give you one thing, that you will be proud of yourself to being Hungary. So all of these, you know, failures of the transition, it will be transformed into a very, you know, believable and very uh, real, actually real, uh, pride. And people in my country blaming those people who made this decision and saying that, oh, you were too stupid, and you were not, you know, seeing the real issues, and you were just, you know, mesmerized by this puppet master. Uh, but actually, I guess uh, this is absolutely, uh, this is not a cure, uh, an accurate reading of the actual um, historic event. Because that was a very reasonable decision back in 2010 to go with Orban Victor's uh, uh, reign. So, after such a 20 years, there was really a person who seemed, you know, focused, who seemed uh, uh, trained, educated, and, 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 and trustworthy enough, despite, all, despite the facts of all of his corrupt issues. Because everybody knew that, yes, he was just as corrupt as any other people, but despite all of his corrupt issues, he was capable of really building a political community which is very integrated and very well structured. So maybe he knows something and he, he actually knew something and still knows something that he was able to, despite all of his failures, really said that uh, if you follow me and if you follow this path, then we will be able to, despite all of our failures, turn this into a successful uh, a success or a victory or something like that. And I guess in a mass society like any 21st century developed society, you only need a spectacle to deliver a believable spectacle of, uh, of a good life. You don't have to deliver anything and you don't have to change anything. Just give me a believable spectacle. And he did it extremely well. 
I'm curious how this understanding that you seems to me have towards the people who vote for Orban and sustain his regime for how many years now, um, how is this coloring your activism? Tell us now uh, about how you engaged in your resistance. When did it come? Because it seems to me now listening to you, you might have even voted for him in 2010, no, I don't know. <laughs> but at that time it was not such a threat, uh, it didn't look like it. When did you come to the realization that there is a need for resistance and how this understanding of the reasons why people vote for him colors what you do? I, I, I go to that question just one more sentence because it's important to understand my point. I'm not, you know, um, I didn't vote for Orban, never. I never voted for Orban. <laughs> But it's important to understand that those who opposed Orban's reign, uh, you know, they were saying that those institutions we created during the transitions are valuable and, you know, the rule of, uh, of justice and stuff like that. So these are the achievements of the transition. So please be careful and take care of these achievements. But, you know, the reality was that these achievements didn't save and didn't defend the most um, um, weak uh, parts of the society. So if you were a worker, and even if there was a code of labor, didn't deliver you anything at all, you, even, you weren't even able to go against your chief and say that, hey, I have 20 paid days in a year, and you didn't give me even 10. Okay, then you have two options, find another job or accept the situation weak unions, and so, so I, could, I, I, I could go on and on and on and saying that these achievements, the Supreme Court, independence, and, and so, so these were not worth enough for the majority of the society, and not because they didn't understand the function of these institutions, but because they understood that these institutions uh, said something or promised something, and they didn't deliver it exactly as they should. So it's a lie. But that guy didn't lie because he is really a core nationalist. He's really fighting for the, I don't know, supreme uh, position of the Hungarians. And that's somehow believable. So if I have two options, choose the lie, which says that it defends me and doesn't, didn't deliver anything, or go with the nationalist one who is, you know, seems strong, and if I hear it, I feel myself a bit stronger. And it's good to listen to it because he is the only one who says something, you know, proudable about the Hungarians. Okay, I choose proud because that's something for me. And to your question, um, which was what? Well, tell us about your activism, maybe about how you activism, started yes. and what you did, how. Um, it's, so my political awareness is deeply connected to 2010 when Orban was firstly elected with the two-thirds, with the constitutional majority, because just in the first year, he completely, uh, you know, rejected the entire uh, juridical system, the, the entire uh, framework of the previous Hungarian state. So, so he changed in one and a half or two years' time uh, uh, the election system. Uh, he started to dismantle the previous Supreme Court and fill it with new members. Uh, he completely changed how the parties are financed and how the state media is working and so on and so on and so on. I will not go into details, but it was obvious that it, this is a sudden change, a shock for the, for, for the society, but the society doesn't, um, you know, um, not understand because they understood it if they had the information, but, you know, not aware of the fact that it's happening. Because already back at that time, he tried to uh, steal uh, the public information in front of the public. So if you own the public media, and right now the public media only you know, deliver the messages of the government, just a tiny, really tiny fraction of the opposition information are reaching the people, and I don't know, just after 10 o'clock p.m. So it's not, you know, it's not you know, fair representation for the opposition. So, and if you are owning the commercial media too, uh, if you are owning the newspapers, if you are owning the local media too, that you cannot talk about the freedom of the press and you cannot talk about that people have access of 
of, of, of different information because they have only access to one narrative, and this narrative is created by the government. And it was very obvious at the end of 2010, just half a year after uh, he got first uh, in power with the two sub majority. So that was the time when I was the managing, not the production manager of Chalk Circle Creator Curve. And um, it was a sudden shock because we, was a, we were an independent theater group and it meant that um, we, were, uh, we were relying on Hungarian state funds on one hand, but on the international funds as well because this was the, the structure of the budget. And it was already obvious that they, are, they will decrease the Hungarian funds, and it happened. Um, it was almost banned uh, for Creator Curve, for example, uh, completely re, uh, removed. Um, so it was obvious that we have to do something. We have, it, so it, on one hand, it was a, it was a, it was a, I know it sounds too uh, um, martyrian, but it was a kind of a civic duty. And on the other hand, it was a, absolutely personal uh, feeling that, okay, if we won't fight back, we will be uh, erased. So first I organized a demonstration when the new constitution was passed in the parliament, and then I joined two different groups, and Creator Curve Chalk Circle also joined two different groups. But short story, like, long story short, uh, the, the outcome is three <laughs> constitutional majority uh, uh, in a chain, so um, after each other. So, uh, if you are asking me that why people are going still with Viktor Orbán's, um, you know, government, and is it a, a fair outcome of the election? First, I said no, it's not a fair outcome of the election uh, because there were many frauds and many cheatings, actually documented cheatings. So, for example, when Alexander van der Bellen was uh, elected as president, maybe I'm not correct, but there was two rounds. The first round was erased because of an open envelope or something like so a tiny thing. And in Hungary, it happened that in just one uh, voting district, and there are 106, but just in one voting district, it was documented that a thousand uh, double nationality people, uh, Hungarian, Ukrainian double nationality people, were transported from Ukrainian villages to the Hungarian soil to vote. It was documented, so I'm not talking about rumors. I'm talking about actually filmed interviews and, 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 and transportations. And the court said that yes, it was a cheat. It was a fraud, election fraud. But, but why, why should it be a fraud? They have the right to vote, don't they? Uh, they have the right to vote, but uh, it's illegal by the Hungarian law to transport anybody uh, to vote. So if we are, we, we, if I, as a, I don't know, Budapest citizen, would pick up, I don't know, a bus and fulfill it with people, and I would just like to help them, it would be illegal. So it's, it's, not, um, uh, it's not legal. Because of different reasons, I, and I guess it's, 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 it's a good system, but the point is that the court said, the high, highest court said that, okay, it was a fraud, it was a cheat, but nothing happened. So they didn't, say, they didn't dare to say that, okay, the election in that uh, voting district should be uh, uh, repeated. Mm. So that's the problem, that we are living in a society where the obvious you know, cheats and frauds have absolutely no consequences at all. And I guess it, it, it's very, it, it, it resonates much with, with the Austrian society, because back at that time when this Ibiza tape came out, I get, okay, I'm talking about myself, and I, but I saw that, okay, FPA will never, so it's impossible to, to, to live it through, so to survive after such a disastrous corruption scandal, taped, so not just, you know, rumors, taped. Uh, and it seems that there will be a new coalition among them. So uh, it's very devastating that uh, uh, Hungary and society has got to used to corruption as a normal phenomenon, but it seems to me that even an Ibiza tip doesn't make a change in such a society like the Austrian one. You have been involved in organizing many um, actions, uh, platforms, activist platforms. Uh, I'm very much interested, there is, these are probably one-off events sometimes, like there is a crisis, like with the Central European University, you're mobilizing people. I'm curious, what is the, 
um, number of people that you managed to mobilize. Uh, is this the massive? Are you representative for your generation? Uh, do you think that you're changing something, that you are giving voice to many people uh, like you? Or is it a kind of a voice in the desert, as one can say? It's a very two-faced thing. Because yesterday there was also this uh, Fridays for Future uh, demonstration in, in Budapest. And we have equal numbers with, your, with yours. So we had also seven or 8,000 people or uh, young kids on the street. And it was the same in Vienna, I guess. I think more. More? I think they said 8,000? No, How much? 30,000, I think. 30? They said something this, I heard, yeah. heard 8,000. OK. No, no, no. OK, you are okay, better. OK, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the thing is, you know, in Hungarian terms, it's a huge number, and especially uh, about so, so teenagers. Uh, it's, it's really a very inspiring uh, phenomenon. So it's, it's great, I think. But on the other hand, just the day before this climate uh, demonstration, an extreme right-wing attack occurred in the 8th district against a Jewish community place where an LGBT uh, event was happening. There was a screening, a closed event, so not even promoting uh, homosexualism or... I don't know what's the term for it in international um, uh, right-wing circles, but the thing is that this uh, right-wing, uh, extreme right-wing uh, neo-fascist uh, gang uh, occupied the space, uh, plugged off the projectors, and uh, used their banners to say that stop doing this propaganda event. And the police forces were outside of the building, and despite the fact that this was a private place, despite the fact that this was a private event, they didn't invade the place and remove those gangsters, but they were just staying there for a couple of hours till the gangsters decided, okay, we achieved what we wanted because they banned an actual event, and then they move away. So these two things that on one hand, uh, when something happens, the urban society responds and resonates. On the other hand, this kind of a microaggressive uh, you know, attacks are occurring day after day after day. During this election, this was the first time in Hungarian history after the transition that the campaign headquarters was invaded by police forces where, because there was a report coming from an unknown individual who says that there were some um, frauds going on with the registration of the private uh, information of the voters. Uh, even the local election committee said that no such an event occurred, but still the police forces invaded there and took laptops and made you know, investigations with the activists and so on and so on and so on. And it's still not on the level as it is in Turkey or at, as it is in Russia, of course. So it's not a dictatorship, but a very authoritarian regime which openly, you know, uh, openly closes its eyes when these gangsters trying to provoke those people who are absolutely peacefully just trying to, you know, watch a movie and use police forces to somehow put an extreme pressure on very weak groups who are just trying to, you know, somehow being in opposition against the brutal regime in the 8th district. So these two things are... Um, um, see, uh, parallelly uh, existing uh, next to each other. So it's, it's to respond to your question, uh, it's, it's getting more hard and hard to mobilize people and say that it is worth to go and you know, stand on the streets and fight for any cause because we are living in a society where during these past nine years, nothing had a consequence. So no political scandal occurred by the government or someone related to the government had any consequence at all. And, you know, living in such an environment is very, you know, depressing, of course, and you, it's, not, it's very hard to give uh, a believable reason for the people that, yes, it is worth to stand up and go outside and, you know, it's worth to organize yourself and so on and so on. And so, on. so right now, I think what, 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 what we need is... is um, is more local community work with those people who are still trying to do something but feel so lonely and so, you know, um, depressed because of this, uh, these things I, I, I mentioned to you. And there is one more thing, and maybe I can... May, may I show the... 
No, Did there you? will be now one. I want to ask you also okay. Okay, about, sorry. because one thing is the street demonstration, the other thing is the community work, but you're doing something else with this political YouTube channel, which is sustainable work throughout the years. What are you trying to achieve with that? And tell us about how you do it and how it looks. What is the audience you're addressing and how? First, when I launched this uh, YouTube channel, I wanted to create uh, a, a John Stewart style uh, show where we satirically deal with the daily political events. But after, such, uh, after a couple of years, I realized that such a format could not work in Hungarian context. On one hand, because I don't ha didn't have the talent for that, but the other hand is that, on the other hand is that, uh, if you make a joke about something which is really outrageous, I'm not talking about you know bullshit of a politician. I'm not talking about uh, a politician who is made who made a comment or 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 or, or was cowed by someone with a corruption scandal. I'm talking about really outrageous thing when they ban an institution or when they harass a person or something like that. If you make a joke about that, then you deliver an easy exit for your audience saying that, okay, we laughed about that, yes, you know, it's horrible, and then we go on. So if you don't want to channel the frustration of the people outside, but you want to push them forward to realize, to, 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 to make them to realize that yes, frustration will not go away, if you don't do anything, then you have to do something to, to, to make them to realize this, that you, you, sh you shouldn't laugh about this, you should take it serious, and you should act if you don't agree with this thing. And that's why I changed the tone of the YouTube channel, and that's why I changed the tone of my activism. So I didn't try to, I, I still use the, 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 the tools of humor and stuff like that, but I didn't try to label it as comedy, I tried to label it as, kind of an investigative journalism, and I'm saying that, okay, if you are outraged about this, that here are the political parties, here are the unions, here are the NGOs, you can do something. You are capable of doing something, but of course, it takes time, it takes efforts, it takes a lot of things, it takes courage, um, but if you want to achieve something, you have to invest into these activities. So that's why uh, I changed the tone, and right now we are more like, an investigative documentary group, so we are making documentaries on uh, political frauds about um, politicians who are who are underrepresented in the in the media, but 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 worse to 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 watch and stuff like that. Because just imagine a society where you have daily newspapers, but daily newspapers don't print investigative stories, don't print investigative interviews, don't print anything really versus despite all of those daily, I don't know, you know, political scandals. So no background stories, no context, no month-long interviews or, or investigative uh, work, uh, because they don't have the financial support for that, they don't have the financial context for that, the budget for that, and they don't have the people for that, and they don't have the reader for that. That's the, <laughs> the last one, but that's a very important part. Uh, and on the other hand, there are no you know, TV channels who do that, or no radio stations who will do that. There are only a tiny fractions of uh, internet news sites which are doing that, who are under a lot of pressure, who are under a lot of financial pressure, because of course, if you are in such a power like Viktor Orban, you can easily, easily say to companies that if you uh, buy advertisements at that certain media group, then there will be consequences. So it's very important, just, just one example, sorry, if I go into tiny details, just shut me off. That when there was a big scandal with, uh, with Deutsche Telekom in Hungary called Hungarian Telekom, and the CEO was removed and the new guy was uh, elected. Uh, and this new guy was the CEO of Hungarian Telekom for such a long time, for almost 10 years. And um, during that time, Deutsche Telekom uh, sold, sold uh, its uh, website, news site called Orico, which was the most prestigious, most important news site. One of the most, there are two really prestigious and important news sites in Hungary, and one of them was Orico. And it was financed by Deutsche Telekom through this Hungarian branch, and it was sold out. And other, you know, uh, company government relations were, 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 were established, and it was obvious that Deutsche Telekom 
prior to 2010 was not that much involved into uh, business with the Hungarian government. And during the time of the CEO, it became more and more involved into the Hungarian government. And he just, and then scandal erupted with, the, with Microsoft in Hungary. Uh, I don't go into details, but the thing is that they were almost sentenced at a US court for, uh, for a penalty, but they made a deal and then the case was uh, dismissed. Uh, and the CEO of Microsoft was kicked out and this guy was hired by the Hungarian Microsoft, the CEO. So the guy who previously, you know, solved a scandal between the company and the Hungarian state, this corruption scandal, and then was, you know, a guy who was responsible for selling prestigious and very important parts of the Deutsche Telekom branch to the Hungarian government, was, is right now in charge of dealing with the issues of Microsoft. And it's already the rumor that new, uh, uh, new contracts between Microsoft and the Hungarian government was, are, are under, you know, uh, um, are going on. So it's important to see that Viktor Orban is not capable of doing all of these horrible things because he is kind of an uh, infant terrible and he is, you know, kind of a guy who is not accepted at, uh, on, 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 on a worldwide stage. No, he's the person who clearly understood at the very beginning that what kind of uh, role could Hungary fulfill uh, in the chain of commodity uh, within this context of, hunger, of international capitalism. And because of that, he delivers the lowest corporate taxation rate in the entire European Union. He also delivers the highest VAT taxation in the, not just in the entire European Union, in worldwide. Uh, also, we have the weakest labor code in the entire, not just European Union, but in the entire region, Central Eastern European region. So if you are an investor or if you are an international uh, company leader, Hungary is a heaven for you, is a heaven because uh, there are special contracts between companies and governments, so you will get more tax benefits, you even could get tax uh, uh, state subsidies, and so on, and so on, and so on. There was uh, a poll against manager CEOs of these foreign companies uh, operating within Hungary, uh, and more than 95% of these CEOs and managers, top managers, I'm talking about top managers, said that if they would have the right to vote, they would vote Viktor Orban. Because he delivers a lot to these companies. And because of that, of course, harming the freedom of you know, press or harming the freedom of education is not a real issue. Of course, some scandals are you know, happening and he got some bad, I don't know, uh, coverage in newspapers in Germany. But the thing is that still he is in the position, no one questioning his corruption scandals, because everybody understands the deal. He delivers the tax benefits, he delivers the direct state funds, and in return, he delivers closed eyes when something is going on, like the ban of CEU, like the ban of the Hungarian uh, Academy, and so on, and so on, and so on. At this point, I would like to open uh, the floor for you all to ask questions to Marton. Um, Please uh, raise May a I hand. Ask one question and to the audience before. Yes, uh, just uh, I want to say that the microphone will come to you then here and then after that. Yeah, to you. Just before, just one short question. Sorry, sir. That, is there any representative on behalf of the Hungarian government here in the venue? Please raise your hand. <laughs> no one, really. And this is the first time when I'm presenting something in front of a foreign audience, because in the Netherlands, in France, in Germany too, always they are delegating uh, someone from the local embassy, so. Well, I think we should improve. We are probably not seen as, yeah. as an important venue. You don't from the hangar, so on Facebook. We, we should work on that. Sorry, sir. Yeah, hi. Uh, Ivan Vejvoda from the Institute for Human Sciences. I wanted to ask you a question about how you see the responsibility, and it goes along the lines of Des what Desi was asking you the responsibility of the social democratic government, governments and their inefficiency in delivering social benefits, to speak simply, 
that then led to voters saying, well, these guys are for nothing, and as you eloquently said, Viktor Orban seems to be our solution. You know, when uh, Jurchan's sentence was revealed, oh, you know, we lied about this and that. So responsibility of social democracy, and second short question, uh, how is your father? <laughs> you have to shut me off because I will, I will go into details and then you have to... Don't go into details because I, I think there will be not, many questions. Okay. There are two more waiting. First response. Last year there was a national election in Hungary. And uh, the, prime, the candidate of prime minister of the left was a guy who was a strong, you know, a vocal supporter of, uh, of uh, minimum income. Uh, that was his core issue for years. And when he became the candidate, he didn't say a single word about that. He just talked about, you know, change. He's right now actually the candidate for mayor of Budapest, so uh, hopefully he will uh, be able to cast the position. But the pro problem is that uh, uh, the Hungarian so-called Socialist Party, actually it was never a Socialist Party, that's a problem on one hand, not even a Social Democrat Party, Democratic Party, so they, 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 they don't dare to touch the fundamental pillars of the system. So they don't talk about extra taxation of the companies. They don't talk about increasing the minimum wage. They don't talk about this at all because they so, um, because of many reasons, of course. On one hand, they don't have the media representation, so the liberal media would, you know, uh, uh, label them as, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, Marxist, insane people. But on the other hand, they don't have, you know, membership who would, you know, push them forward that you should fight for these causes. And the problem is that uh, uh, if you don't rely on your membership, but you are rely on the coverage in the press, then you are following the agenda of those newspapers and those journalists who are, of course, not, you know, suffering, uh, that, n n not that much suffering of the consequences of, uh, of, uh, of a capitalist society as, for example, workers in the factory. Just one more example. Suzuki factory banned an official union operating within the factory. So uh, Suzuki has a factory in Hungary since the transition or after a couple of years of the transition and never an official union was existing within Trade the factory. Union. Trade union. Trade, Trade union, union, yes. Mm. And right now, uh, and this year, at the beginning of this year, on, around January, a factory worker organized some guys around himself and said, the, factory uh, owner that we will create a trade union. He was immediately fired. And he's right now in the court and, you know, fighting for that. But the thing is that, one, trade union still doesn't exist in Suzuki factory. And B, or second, uh, Hungarian parties, only one member of the parliament are fighting for this guy and for the trade union in the Suzuki factory. And the other parties, first they reacted, of course, yes, we are with the workers and we have to defend. Uh, half a year later, only this one guy chains himself in front of the gate of the, trade, uh, of the factory, which of course on one hand seems silly, but on the other hand, it's the bravest respond you can ever make in such an environment. But, you know, liberal, uh, liberal media still somehow labels him as a kind of uh, silly figure. But he is actually a hero in my eyes. And my father is well. Thanks, okay. Thanks for the question. <laughs> Thank you. There is a question there. Thank you for being here today. Um, by the way, just because no one discloses themselves as uh, representing Hungarian interests doesn't mean there isn't one here. That's true. Uh, which you probably know. Um, my question is this, if you were Russian, you could be under pretty substantial surveillance and intimidation for what you do, uh, and you're Hungarian, so I'm curious what that level of uh, uh, threat is to you personally in terms of what you do and how you have to uh, conduct yourself. Thank you. Of course I am under such a threat, but I don't like to portray myself as a martyr because there are many other activists who are way more courageous than I am and are the, under a lot of, lot more pressure than I have to deal with. So I can name you homeless activists who are, you know, without the home fighting for decent housing for the rest of the society and, you know, they got penalties from the 
police and stuff. So really horrible things. And I'm a kind of, so I'm a mainstream figure in my country. So they don't touch me at every you know, step because they know that it can backfire. But for example, I was just sentenced for 204 public physical work uh, um, a couple of months before. But for example, it's a great, it's a great uh, opportunity to me to go to the eastern part of the country and spend my penalty there as a public worker in a mid-sized town where the Roma populace and the non-Roma populace have great tensions among themselves. And we will create a documentary about this entire experience. So I can use this kind of a penalties as, you know, uh, chances or opportunities or open windows to, to, to make something, something out of this. And the real, the real threat is not coming from the state directly. The real threat is, for example, because I'm, I'm working as a communication expert or uh, even sometimes a political advisor. And for example, companies started to offer me contracts where they openly uh, admit that if I'm doing any political activities during, I don't know, our, during the time or the period of our contract, then I will not just lose the, the fee, but I will pay a penalty for the company. And I, you know, I, I, I asked lawyers that, please, is, the, is it legal, really? So could they do that? And yes, they can do it. So my only chance to be contracted and get you know, the necessary salary or income uh, which I need to, for example, sometimes uh, not, you know, being politically active, because that's the only, you know, income I have. Mm. Wow, very effective. Question there, and then two. Okay. Shall we collect, let's collect three questions, and then you try to address them all. Yeah. Hi, my name is uh, Aga Kościuszka, and I'm working in Polish Academy of Science. I'm from Poland, and I feel you so well, <laughs> and it's really scary, because... Uh, this is the same what, what is happening in Poland right now. And uh, so the half of, of the nation is voting for Kaczynski and his party. And the half of the nation is asking a question, how the hell is this possible? And we don't understand what they're doing really, because they're doing terrible things. We also have the scandals almost every week and nothing happened. Like, there is no strong opposition. And also regarding to your, to your satirical uh, canal. And so we were famous, Poland was famous in communist times for its opposition and also for its satirical opposition, for its jokes about communist party. We don't have it anymore. Like last week, I was watching the film about, the new film about the uh, political in, in Poland and it's supposed to be a comedy. And I didn't laugh at one time because it just, it just wasn't funny because all this was true. And I cannot understand it, why we cannot fight them, why there's no strong opposition and why there is no, why the satire and jokes and the, this kind of fight isn't working. And I wanted to ask you about it, and your, how do you see the similarity, similarity between the, the Poland and Hungary? Okay. There was, let's click, there was here and there. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, this is uh, indeed uh, frightening what is going on, and that such a large part of the so-called middle class who are doing pretty well economically uh, on a technical level, maybe even as teachers, etc., by all this ideology of the family and of the, uh, yes, the, Hungar the Hungarian nation and uh, the high uh, level of development of the uh, Hungarian nations and completely disregard uh, anti-Semitic uh, propaganda uh, the most famous one was in, uh, not only here and uh, also in Germany, uh, the posters against Soros, uh, which were clearly anti-Semitic. And uh, if you address them, I have some relatives in Hungary, they feel very annoyed. Huh? For instance, also the fact, because I lived also in Macedonia, now Northern Macedonia, the fact that the former prime minister who was sentenced for pure corruption 
uh, could flee with official help from uh, uh, Hungarian uh, diplomats to Hungary and is getting asylum, whereas at the same time, of course, the Orban regime is, uh, in, uh, it is something which is, I think, particularly popular with the majority of the Hungarians, is fighting any kind of migration, particularly from uh, Muslims. Um, so, and the question is? The, the question is, um, uh, how could it happen that the, the particular this middle class is uh, accepting this? Okay, and there's another one there. I'll be brief. Um, my question relates to you, what was the motivation in you moving from art to activism? I understand when you lose funding, it is, um, it is a um, structural, structural problem, but also the power of art. Art can also talk about certain things, and especially I've seen and appreciate a lot of your work through the theatre, has a power to communicate a lot of the ideas that you're trying to do that right now. And secondly, would it not be worth considering fighting the system, not from within, but outside? And that's something that might help you with funding and maybe getting more uh, sympathy from the outside world. Cool. Thanks. Thanks for all the questions. So first, yes, uh, I think it's a, it's a problem that uh, the Western society is, you know, labeling everything. So, so they are saying that Orban is the problem and they, you know, don't reflect on the phenomenon that there is Kaczynski in Poland, Babiš in Czech, and there is, so you can go on, 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 and these guys are in coalition, so they are moving uh, very strategically with each other, so they are relying on each other. So it's not just Hungary on its own, but it's, it's Poland, it's, it's, it's Serbia, it's, uh, it's Czech, and it's, some, it's Romania too. So I guess this kind of uh, um, semi-fascist right-wing agenda is, is extremely strong because they realize that, uh, that if they you know, delegate the, the tasks among each other and they are using uh, each of us, each, each of everyone's uh, resources, then they go further. So they are helping each other in the European Union, on the international level, and so on. This was, there was this corruption scandal in the US that the, that the Polish government hired an advertisement agency who is, you know, was responsible for I don't know, promoting the, the greatness of, of Poland, and then it turned out that it was a corruption scandal related to a historian who was a member or a close friend or ally of the government. This is the Hungarian model, so it was just adapted by them because Hungary also used these uh, American uh, ventures to bribe money and, and, and steal money and, and, and stuff like that. So there are a lot of similarities, but one difference is very important, and that's why I um, um, sometimes envy you that you still have a very strong opposition parties, uh, relatively strong, you know, in, 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 in in the context of the Hungarian parties. So they are still capable of mobilizing people and you had this kind of a breakthrough on the municipality level. So there are opposition owned cities in the countryside, which is important because that doesn't exist in Hungary. There will be municipality elections in two weeks time in Hungary and maybe that will happen too in Hungary finally, but there is a very little chance for that and there is a greater chance that this a total reign of urban victors will continue, not just on the state level, not just on the governmental level, but on the municipality level too, because he established his power in the municipalities back in 2006. Uh, but we can talk about it later personally. Okay, next one was your The question. middle class. Uh, mid the middle class. Yeah. Uh, I guess uh, it's very easy. Uh, they have flat taxation. Uh, they have huge subsidies coming from the government, I mean the middle class families. Uh, they are subsidizing the children if you have uh, a certain income, a certain wage. So middle, actually middle class families are in a better shape right now than they were before 2010. So they are really, uh, you know, um, um, uh, the, so th th actually they got a lot from the government in, 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 in every term actually. So if you have a certain income around uh, 1,500 euro per month or even above, then you have a huge income because you have huge tax relief and, and so on and so on. And it's very hard to you know, explain to someone who is a beneficiary of the system to say that, okay, 
please get rid of all of your privileges and please vote for something which is absolutely unsure, absolutely, you know, different, and maybe you will have to pay extra taxes, but it will be good for the rest of the society. That's just not a plan which will work. So Orban Viktor clearly understood that there are three major parts of the society, of the Hungarian society. The first part is the middle class, which he, you know, um, benefit, he, 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 he spent a lot of benefits to them, and, despite, uh, and, and in return they support him. The middle one is, the biggest one, is the uncertain part, which, you know, uh, absolutely uh, weak and don't, that doesn't have a, a, a decent and a, and a solid income. So they are, they, if, if they will see that there is some benefits coming from the election, they will go with the narrative. And there is a third part which, you know, doesn't able to organize itself, doesn't able to get a representation, and doesn't able to raise their voice and be loud in the public. So this, this is the part which, you know, with, with, with Orban Victor doesn't deal at all and says, okay, these are the deplorables. Uh, they don't have political, you know, uh, activities, so they don't mean any harm to my power. But we can go on into details mm -hmm. later. And about my turn, uh, it's interesting because around 2014, 2015, I made this turn, so I became uh, clearly more political than artistic. But right now, after the last year's election, and after these ex uh, experiences I got in, 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 in political activism, right now I see that there is really a need to go back to the artist scene and, 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 and create theater and create feature films and documentaries. Because on one hand, of course, I, I, I'd like to deal with uh, those issues which are related to the poorest uh, part of Hungary. But the problem is that I am much more, um, um, how can I say, um, authentic if I'm talking to the middle class or to the upper middle class. Theater is the business of the upper middle class, of course. But it's still important to somehow, you know, raise the awareness because the Hungarian theater is extremely retrograde. So it, it still deals with issues which are absolutely not, you know, uh, conscious with the current context. I just can I can just name the entire Me Too scandal, which was also uh, happening in Hungary, and the outcome was really devastating because the guy who was one of the most, um, you know. Uh, brutally uh, related to this entire scandal in Hungarian context was somehow, you know, saved by the professionals of the Hungarian theater and the victims who were, you know, victims of this uh, guy uh, was lab uh, 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 labeled as, you know, um, scarecrows or something like that. Of course, I, I simplified the story, but that's the, uh, that's the that's the, that, that's the whole point. So I, I think it's, it's, it's really important to be conscious about who are your audience and which class do they belong to. And I think there is still a lot of work with, uh, with the middle class. And not just about you know, making them feel you know, bad about their privileges, but really just you know, talk about your privileges or realize your privileges. That's a problem with Hungary that, uh, that the middle class doesn't even know about that this term or these you know, frames of privilege exist. So for example, even those who are defending the rights of the Roma people and saying that those marches and all, all of these uh, things which were you know, uh, happening around 2010 to threat, uh, for threatening the, the Roma communities. Of course, liberals defended the Romans and said that, okay, we have, they have equal rights with us. But then they added to the sentence, because they have a different culture and they live by different norms and we have to respectful with these norms. So they don't see this as a, you know, entire um, society. They see it as, okay, we are here as white Hungarians and here are those who are the Roma people and of course they are equal with us, but strange and a bit loud and a bit, you know, um, different. By culturally, and they don't understand that this is racism itself. And I'm not saying that you are racist. I'm just saying that you are not capable of realizing the context of the question, and you don't understand uh, the deeper meaning of your sentences, and you don't understand that you are you are in the need to educate yourself about this issue. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Martin, for this very complex picture that you drew uh, in front of us on politics in contemporary Hungary. Thank you. Take your the program. And